we came across a classification that existed in um, poetry, in South Indian poetry from uh, many centuries ago, from Sangam poetry. And that is where they had spoken of five phase of five kinds of landscape, the five kinds of landscape that is riverine, pastoral, desert, coastal, and mountainous. And these were spoken of in terms of, not only in terms of geographies, but also in terms of emotions. So these five landscapes resonated with different states of love. And the way they had described it in the poetry was one as emotions, and secondly, also as a documentary kind of a landscape. In a sense, when, we were, when they would talk about the riverine region, they would talk about which kind of art was practiced there, what kind of people lived there. So it was also a kind of documentary framework that existed. So we thought of using this documentary framework of looking at landscape, which, was also, which also had a lot of emotional overtones, to look at the craft traditions of India. Because ultimately, when we look at craft, it is not just about something that is produced with the hand, but it's also a lot about emotions. It's about feelings, the feeling with which a craftsman produces it, the feeling with which somebody buys it, and the way it is cherished and looked after. And finally, a, a craft also has a life, and when the life of it ends, it is, it, the li it's thrown away with a certain amount of emotion. So we thought of looking at craft from an emotional perspective, and we thought this document, this fivefold classification of land will be good will be a very good frame, framework for us to start looking at and then we thought of how do, which particular crafts do we pick out from the various from the many crafts that exist in india which exact crafts do we pick and why do we choose to highlight and then when we started looking at the crafts we thought we should pick crafts we should choose crafts that are in some way resonant with the landscape so the various crafts that we have selected, whether it is the Namda from the mountainous regions, it evolves from the need to keep yourself warm in the mountainous region. And if you were to look at Sheetalpati from the riverine regions where it tends to get hot, it is to do with the need to keep yourself cool. So it is about the relationship between man, his environment and his needs. So we started looking at this framework and we, we, came, we selected about 10 crafts as an initial um, uh, as our initial uh, list. And then we started shortlisting them. Some of them did not work out because we could not contact the craftspeople. And some of them we did not choose because we felt they would not resonate with the landscape or speak of the landscape in any significant way. So then we selected these seven landscapes and we visited most of these places except for Kashmir, which we could not go because of uh, the conditions that were there. And then when we went and saw the craftspeople, we also tried to understand how the craft is transforming over time. So as the landscape evolves, how is the craft transforming? How are the craftsmen looking at their crafts and what is the kind of sentiment that they have towards their practice? We tried to understand that. And uh, one thing we also tried to understand in this was what was the sentiment that they attached to the material? So the material had a very important basis because most of the crafts, the material that they use may be incidental in many ways, something that they find just from the environment. But very often it's also imbued with certain amount of philosophical overtones or certain sentimental overtones. For example, I remember Henry Glassy, when he writes about um, terracotta, he writes that the, about the Durga sculpture that is created, he writes that the sculpture should not be fired because once it is fired, the clay the lack of water in it will not connect with the water that's in your heart. So the water, the moisture content has to be there in the clay so that it connects with the, with your own, with the water in your own being. So materials are very often at, are at the heart of a craftsman's practice and it dictates both the way they approach the craft, the form that it takes and also the sentiment that they attach to it. So we started looking at the materials that are there and how when the environment itself transforms, how the craftsmen are changing the materials that they use and what do they feel towards these changes. So these are the kind of stories that we have um, tried to narrate through the, thread, through, the, through the exhibition. And while we, one of the core points in this um, entire exhibition is why we thought we should do an exhibition of this sort is that uh, we realize that an important aspect of the craft tradition is the spirit of live and let live, a spirit of coexistence that is there between man and nature. 
and between man and other living beings also for example in the manjusha tradition it is about man coexisting with the snakes it's not about man killing the snakes so there is a spirit of coexistence that's there in the crafts and that is something that we thought we should highlight through our exhibition and um, as far as today's panel discussion goes we thought when we were dealing with the crafts when we went and met the craftsmen and we were listening to their stories we thought we realize that the crafts are transforming in a very big way not only because of the initiative of the craft people but also because of the initiative of designers uh, designers who come and choose to work with craft people do design development initiatives and things like that and secondly also because of the interventions of galleries and auction houses so crafts in recent times have been transforming in different ways and we thought this forum can be a place where we can deliberate on how it is changing and um, what are why it is changing in this particular direction uh, dr anapurna garimela who is the moderator for the evening will talk a little bit more in detail about it uh, but just to introduce the speakers and the, the panelists and the moderator uh, dr anapurna garimela the moderator is a delhi based designer and an art historian Her research focuses on late medieval Indic architecture and the history and practices of vernacular art forms in India after independence. She heads Jackfruit Research and Design, an organization with a specialized portfolio of design, research and curatorial initiatives. She is also the founding and managing trustee of Art Resources and Teaching Trust, a non-profit organization that runs a public art library, conducts research projects and does teaching and advisement for college and university students and the panelists for the evening are mr anmit kumar uh, mr amit kumar heads the delhi office at, of saffron art as the associate vice president he has been actively involved in the field of south asian modern and contemporary art since 2002 his expertise includes folk and tribal art a genre that he continues to work with at saffron art previously he served as the head of programs at delhi art devi art foundation sorry and more recently as a director special initiatives at the savara foundation for the arts he was a curator of the colombo art biennale in 2015 as well as reading room and exhibition of book art that was showcased in new delhi mumbai kochi and uk and the other panelists for the evening are ms nancy arjanya uh, ms nancy is a cultural theorist and curator based in bombay Since the 1990s she has written consistently on the practices of four generations of Indian women artists her book the 13th place Position- positionality as critic in the art of navjot altaf extends the field of art history by developing regional histories of marxism feminism and collaborative art practice in the con- context of post colonial indian art she has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writings on media art a uh, public art the biennale culture transcultural art practices and the relationship of art to the public sphere the next panel the other panelist for the evening is ms radhi parekh founder director of artisan center radhi parekh is a graduate in visual communications from the national institute of design she returned to india in 2009 from a career spanning two decades three continents and several technologies from designing and illustrating children's book at osborn publishing london and multimedia games in Sa- in san francisco to creating online software in silicon valley for oracle and ebay radhi helped extend expand their footprint by advocating localization to build truly global products thank you all for being thank you panelists and the moderator for being here and thanks to the uh, audience for being here i let dr anapurna take over Okay. So, I think the way to do this is for me to set out some issues in front of us um which have circulated been circulated to the panelists prior to this event and then open it up for each panelist to do a brief discussion. Uh Nancy, I'll ask her to go first because she has a presentation as well. and i think that would be really nice to use this wonderful screen that's there um so before starting let me just sort of give you all a little historical capsule 
just to kind of frame this exhibition, this conversation. So as many of you know, but I think it's worth repeating, this distinction between art and craft is very new. Let me say that again the, for the 70 millionth time, uh, but I think it's worth repeating. So art and craft, this idea of dividing the art and uh, arts, uh, certain things are art and certain things are craft, has evolved, but I think became really crystallized into a fairly strong division during the Industrial Revolution in the area of manufacturing and artistic production, as well as in uh, pedagogical institutions, in art school institutions. So um, uh, this category of, for example, applied arts uh, could either be the new kinds of crafted things like printmaking or, or um, uh, uh, graphic design today or, and, and any kind of industrialized production. And also, of course, the arts were where you sat in a studio, the, there was an author, you learned very, like a very kind of, clar uh, uh, very kind of a structured curriculum, uh, which included, well, at least for men, nude drawing and, um, and oil on canvas, certain kinds of validated subjects, history, painting. I feel like I'm really short and the podium is as big as I am. Um, so I'll talk over here so you can hear me. Okay, so... Um, so, so this is the kind of division that existed. Now, very quickly, of course, these things are challenged by different kinds of writers, um, whether uh, uh, they're challenging it because uh, they feel it's destroying Indian artistry uh, and being in, through the process of appropriating big skills, like, for example, the, how uh, the Kashmiri shawl was systematically decimated as an art form and then appropriated to um, Scotland and became Paisley, right? So those kinds of things, or because of nationalist reasons, like, uh, in, uh, and, and here's somebody like Kumara Swami, or even Sister Nivedita uh, and her discourse, but also for deeply ethical and political reasons, somebody like Gandhi advocating. Uh, many people, when they think of the word minimalism, they think of it as a Western uh, conceptual art Western meaning in a very loose way, European American uh, engagement uh, with um, uh, uh, conceptual art making. But one could argue, uh, as I, I tried to do very briefly in an essay that's going to be published, that um, Gandhi's approach was also a kind of minimalism in relationship to craft and spatial aesthetics and the way that you know uh, he lived, uh, uh, not just in terms of not spending too much money, but really visually structuring a space. So, uh, so, so all these things are, of course, very um, different approaches. But independence happens, 1947 happens, and everything that was uh, compelled by the court, by the colonial authorities, by industrial uh, organizations, was recalibrated, not annihilated, but recalibrated. And recalibrated because the nation came into the, it's the, 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 a sort of a majoritarian position, right? The idea of the nation. So, for example, when we gained independence, and I repeat this every time, and it seems really important to say it again, given that we're living in a political regime which is saying, making slogans like Make in India, that when independence happened, India did not have any foreign exchange. So where did the foreign exchange come from? From selling crafts, right? So when we talk about like, you know, the crafts people are sort of beneficiaries of the largesse of the government or NGOs or whatever, it's a cycle actually that there was a dependency on the urban and the nation state for the, the kind of uh, economic returns that crafts have historically produced. So whether it was Panipat carpets or, or any of these things, and many of you have gone to the West, if you know Pier 1 imports in the 70s and the 60s, before that there were other things. If you know, for example, Shonali Das Gupta, who had a store in, in Rome, all these people, you know, they, they're like little, little lightning rods for continually, Krishna Ribu, all these people are little, little ride, lightning rods for continually kind of making space for craft to represent to represent and in many ways finance 
India's modernity, India's journey into modernity. So um, very important things happened, like the, the Ministry for Small and Medium Enterprises was set up. So then, you know, get these national awards, national uh, craftsmen, master craftsmen awards. Um, and then you have initiatives, for example, the academies under, um, uh, gosh, I've just lost the, our wonderful uh, Molana Azad uh, 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 said, you know, under his ministership, these three academies were set up. And very interestingly, the Lalit Kala Academy in its initial days had a category for prize giving called traditional sculpture. But somewhere that dropped out, the Lalit Kala Academy could also, for example, print very beautiful albums of uh, Pahadi paintings and all of this. But pretty soon, it could only be about modern or a period contemporary art, right? So we, we made decisions along the way. Maybe it was a bureaucrat, maybe it was a cultural engagement, maybe it was budgetary constraints, but we kept making decisions about how to reinforce that division between what is art and what is craft, right? So there's all kinds of interesting things that happen. Um, of course, there's these things called the festivals of India that travel all, you know, through Europe and, of course, through America. And they happen in the 80s, and they're very key moments. Um, those of you who are living in Bombay will know that the State of Architecture exhibition very nicely highlighted the, 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 the whole uh, sort of engagement with uh, uh, sort of historic artist, architectural history of Indian buildings. Uh, in, in, in the context of the Festival of India. So the Festival of, of India were very crucial in giving uh, a, a, a kind of new identity to certain people who were repositioning crafts, people like Rajiv Sethi. Um, and even before, there were other people, right? Like people like Pupul Jaikar, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyaya, uh, the, crafts the crafts councils. Really, really, really crucial to all of this. And then, of course... In, the, in all of this, there are the, the artists of India, Akbar Padamsi, Manu Parekh, uh, Bhaskar Kulkarni, K.G. Subramaniam, um, Rinalni Mukherjee, all these artists, uh, and of course, uh, Nancy's written the book about Navjot Altaf. Uh, all these artists have been also making like really interesting engagements with various crafts communities and craft forms, or even the idea of craft right? The idea that making is really important or that making is a special kind of consciousness or that making is representative of India. I mean, for various different reasons. But two important things I think are very necessary for me to highlight when I construct this little historical capsule I'm giving to you, which is that uh, when the Crafts Museum and the series of museums like Vishala and later on like Dakshin Chitra, all these sort of uh, very interesting models of, of how to think about time and making and, uh, and, and community and all these artistry, authorship. There, there's no set rules. That's the one thing I think I would really like to communicate, that we are playing with all of this. And the playing is very serious. Amit will tell you, it's worth lakhs of rupees how we play with this. Crores of rupees, right? Um, lives are made and destroyed in this. Crafts communities are um, made and destroyed in all of this. But there is no rules because unlike, um, like say if you're a contemporary artist, um, or, or, or there's, there's a fairly, strat fairly kind of uh, defined set of criteria by which you are designated as a contemporary artist. You know, you get to sign your name, you get to... Uh, you know, have a gallery, all these kinds of things. There's venues, there's art fairs, there's the entire structure. Craft has some of this, for example, the Dastakar Hat Mela, the Craft Mela. But authorship can be there, cannot be there. You can say you're, you're practicing as a member of a certain caste, you can say, I'm practicing as an individual. So Santosh Kumar Das, who's in our audience today, is very much that person who is um, practicing as an individual who's inherited an art language, right? So, um, or you can, for example, um, say I'm a, 
an artist who's trained within my community and family, or you can say, I went to a school called the Mithila Art Institute and learned how to do Madhubani painting there. So they're, they're, the, the rules are not like completely set. And that it opens up a huge possibility, but also it's very, very complex and doesn't protect people. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that artists themselves are always looking, the artists that I have called vernacular in other contexts are called craftspeople, folk and tribal, whatever you want to call them. We can debate about that word pretty interestingly, but I'm not going to do it right now. Um, so they are not necessarily always protected, or are they, nor are they necessarily interested in being protective. I think there is a kind of fast and looseness to the whole thing, which feeds their mobility right now. It may change as all things change. Um, before you couldn't imagine uh, um, a, a, a craftsperson who makes camel uh, 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 ornament being identified in an exhibition as an author, as a make, you know, as, as some kind of person. In this exhibition, it's ident he's identified. So these are, um, these are very important things. So the festivals of India, the, the, the important thing, the Crafts Museum. The Crafts Museum itself is very interesting because Dr. Jane, who is very much involved in framing and structuring it, as many of you know, in the last five, six years, or three, four years, it's now been almost in a demolished state. So we don't know what the next iteration of the Crafts Museum is going to be like. But in the iteration that Dr. Jane was involved in, people like Charles Correa, and many, many artists like Ganga Devi, and Sonabai, and Jangar Singh Sham, and other people found it a conducive space to conduct an experiment and have it be housed. And, and, and valued and, you know, taken care of through conservation. It also became the space that many contemporary artists, the difference being that they, they see themselves, their home is the gallery space, um, also use that space for some of their experiments. So early on, uh, contemporary artists were, were very, a certain generation were very reluctant to be identified with Indian traditions in any way. But somehow Dr. Jane, which I need to talk to him more a little bit, made that space, for example, for someone like Anita Dubé to come and look at beading and crafting and stuff like that, right? And when she did those bone series. So, so those kinds of spaces, it's not just like uh, designers and contemporary artists making interventions. They're also when they look at the crafts, looking at how it comes back into their own practice, into their own logic, into how... Craft and the techniques of craft can also be seen as a set of codified poetics, right? And those poetics are very powerful. And let me tell you, I really believe that Indian uh, people, whether they're artists or people like us, curators, we're really desirous in some way of, of being close to things which are made. That's why we have such a kind of you know, kind of appropriation and, and engagement and debate. And we're kind of constantly trying to say, we want to keep craft. We want to keep craft in our midst. So this is a very big thing. And then, of course, this important exhibition that happened in Paris called Magician de la Terre. Um, it, again, it happened in the 80s uh, or early 90s. I think it was the 80s. No, Nancy? 89, 89 right. So on the cusp. Um, it, it, it also kind of repositioned because um, Jean Hubert, who curated the exhibition, invited artists who he considered magicians of the earth um, from all over the world. Our own Jangar Singh Sham went, and uh, uh, Jyotinder Jain are, was involved. And what it did was, it, in, in some ways, and, and there's a lot of argument about this, but in some ways what it, it did was it seemed to suggest that there might be space for another way of thinking about the contemporary uh, through, through the work of these people who are all living artists. So they had their names and those kinds of things, right? So this happened. Now, then the boom in the art market happened uh, in general, like let's say from about 2001, 2002, Amit? Yeah, late 90s onwards, but really kind of gets after uh, 2001, uh, 
um, takes the ball and runs. And it basically continued more or less till about 2008. And in that space, um, a certain kind of self-defined contemporary contemporaneity um, d came into the art market and did and did not give space to um, discuss these questions in a in a different way. So yes, many artists who are considered uh, practicing vernacular art forms were observing. Sometimes were involved. I've just written a book about one of them whose practice started in 2007 uh, with the American expatriate artist Vaso X Vaso and the painter Rakesh Vijay. But by and large, it seems to me it was after the end of that kind of high crest of the contemporary art market uh, that when it slowed down, people start, began to look at other kinds of art forms, whether it is through exhibitions, like looking at, for example, the new flow of exhibitions like the Group 1890s or looking at ma other masters besides just the Bombay progressive stars, looking at very, very intricate p uh, artists who were not really given widespread notice like Nasri, Nasiruddin, Nasreen Mohammadi, uh, sorry, I've got Nasreen in my mind, Nasreen Mohammadi, and, um, and other things. In that kind of opening, an exhibition called Vernacular and the Contemporary happened, which was funded by the AV Art Foundation, which was also really, to be honest, the big maker of the contemporary art scene because many artists made their art for the Anupam Poddar and his mother and for the Devi Art Foundation. So oddly, uh, one family drove the aesthetics for a decade in India. Whether it was for folk and tribal art or for what is considered, what I've called Anglophone contemporary art, English-speaking contemporary art, right? So now, since that exhibition, which was very interesting and I'm not going to go into it, um, echoes uh, have have developed, different strategies have developed, all kinds of things are happening. Certainly in all of this, another big incident is the death of Ganga Devi, which I think was very important and the context in which she died and lived, and also the death of someone uh, who's very important to this whole conversation, Jangar Singh Sham. Uh, and also the life of many new art institutions made in these communities, the Mithila Art Institute. Um, I am involved with a group that's doing an art residency studio school for Warli painting in the Dungs. Um, and they're a Christian community uh, who, of, of Warli, a Warli Christian community. So there are all these um, pedagogical experiments that are also happening. And these are not initiated in a top-down kind of way. For example, if you're following what's happening in Varanasi, there's a handloom school for weavers there that is developed from within the community, designed by David Ajayi, the architect who's designed the Museum for the African American in Washington, D.C. So there's all these very, like, very interesting things happening all in the... Um, we're involved in, for example, uh, pushing for, um, at the Serendipity Arts Festival, for, for people to use Go and Craft to build a barefoot school of craft there. So I, there's all kinds of initiatives that are happening. And it is in this context that I want to raise five questions and then invite Nancy to maybe five, maybe more, maybe seven. I have to check my numbering. Um, okay, so the first one, these are just questions. I'm going to just lay them out there like little firecrackers in the crowd. So what is craft today? And this needs, this is a question I'm asking from, from the perspective of within the community. How do people who are practitioners of, let's say, weaving or um, choir making or whatever, what is craft today? I don't think it's, there's an there's a eternal definition of craft. And recently, when I was presenting at the Kalagura Festival, I was very keen for people to take up the argument that in, in, in India, we need to see industrial skills as a kind of craft because maybe this is one of the few places in the world where industrialization came the same time 
as it came to the in European countries. So we have people in places like Calcutta and Bombay. Of course, now we are in this space uh, where uh, people have really, really deeply sedimented industrial skills, like fabulous welders. You know, really great um, uh, uh, people who know how to cut metal. You all know that TIFR, for example, made all of its own instruments and glass bottles and all of those kinds of things. So industrial skills are also a craft, I would argue. Let's hear what people have to say with that. What are the ways in which authorship is defined and understood today within crafts communities? So we have a sense, we have a thing that craftsmen are crafts people are anonymous. They're not. Um, for example, just like... Um, there is a, 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 a the singer, the, the, the poet stamp at the end of a song, right? It's called the mudra, uh, where he says, uh, for example, Gopal Krishna Bharati would say, Bala Krishna said this at the end of his song, uh, or, or Jayadeva says it, or Vidyapati says it, anybody says it, right? So there is, what is the notion of authorship? And how is it defined and understood today? And in fact, can the art world that wants to engage with craft, that's so desirous of it, able to actually address that notion of authorship. So, for example, Vaishnavi, um, who is the curator for this exhibition, did a little bit of research in Swami Malay and very interestingly pointed out with the bronze maker that the family was not a traditional family of bronze makers. It had learned it through one of the three legitimized, officially governmentally legitimized ways of being bronze making. But the son who actually made the images in the exhibition, did not want to claim authorship of it, but he, in fact, wanted to give the authorship to his father. So it was, in a sense, retroactively constructing a patrilineage of craft making. So this is neither the copyright way, which says the maker is the author, nor is it the copy left way, which is that, you know, things are in the commons and all of this. This is some other way, and this some other way has no space in our regime. In our legal regime, in the gallery regime, we stuck to what he said, but we are one exhibition in a bazillion, right? Like all these things, right? So that's another thing. So what is creativity today? So this seems like a very vague and fluffy question, but actually the, the definition of creativity is what puts somebody, will, is, is what... Uh, allows an institution, a maker, a curator to position this person as an author and this person as an as a assistant, right? Or this person. So, for example, if you go to, um, if you look at Kiki Smith or you look at um, uh, uh, the, uh, another artist, uh, the very famous glassblower who had recently had a very, uh, very interesting exhibition at MoMA, they're very clear that the glass blower and the bronze makers who make their work are have a status in the exhibition. Whether it's as uh, this person's studio participated in, we don't have that framework. Though, because of the cheapness of labor in India, by and large, that's how art gets made here, right? So we don't have a full understanding of that. Um, can a finely executed piece of craft be placed on par with the contemporary artwork? Um, is it contemporary then, if it's placed? These are questions. In, 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 in other words, what is the equation between skill and concept? So does skill trump concept, or does concept trump skill? Or are they two things that exist in a space, right? And then people are making decisions about which to value for all, all sorts of reasons which I've tried to outline. And then how does one understand um, uh, when living folk artists are auctioned, I hope you speak about this, or maybe you will, in what way do these high-value transactions actually impact the life of the artist? Um, I met a ceramic artist in Bombay yesterday um, who refuses to jack up his prices. He says, I want everyone to be able to afford my work. And he's a true artist because not only is he thinking conceptually about he's engineering his works, he's thinking about glazes, but anyone can afford his work and has been able to afford it. And it travels all over the world. So that's always a really interesting position to take, right? That 
I will, my work will travel into many different kinds of spaces. And, and, so, and so those are the questions I'm going to leave and, uh, the audience with. I'll come back to moderate the question and answer period. But I hope this has been a useful introduction to the panel. I invite um, Nancy Adjanya, uh, critic, cultural theorist, curator, to come and present. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Annapurna. That was a wonderful introduction to our subject. And also thank you, Vaishnavi and uh, Brijeshwari, uh, for this wonderful exhibition. I also like the way in which you revealed your research through the exhibition panels. And um, now I'm not going to waste any more time, and I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Uh, I've called my very brief presentation, The Politics of uh, Acknowledgement the art of deciphering fingerprints. The continuing obsession of the contemporary Indian art world with the artist's signature, individual authorship, and the romantic trope of the artist's genius prevents us from looking at the contributions of other agents or participants to the artist's work. Of course, it depends on who the other actors are. If an artist is collaborating with a documentary filmmaker or a classical singer with whom she or he shares her class assumptions, then they will inevitably be properly acknowledged. But when an artist works with a skilled or semi-skilled artisan, their contribution is magically airbrushed. You could be deceived into believing that the fiberglass sculptor, the papermaker, the embroiderer, and the welder were never there. They never seem to leave their fingerprints on the finished artwork. This abracadabra is surely a result of the malaise that afflicts many Indian artists, the anxiety of sharing authorship. But this conceptual anxiety corresponds to a deeper material anxiety, that of sharing capital. The former acts as a smokescreen for the latter. If for a moment we were to look at the artist not as a holy fool, innocent of the machinations of capital, but as an entrepreneur or capitalist, then the jigsaw puzzle falls into place. In classical economic theory, the capitalist claims profit as the reward for the risk he brings to the enterprise of production, since he might just as easily incur loss. In this logic, the worker owns his labor and receives a wage for offering it to the capitalist. As transported into the economy of artistic production, this means that the artist entrepreneur performs the equivalent of risk-taking in executing his vision and placing his bets on the successful re reception of his work. Accordingly, the artist entrepreneur doubtless pays his workers a fair wage, but does not share his profits with them. Can such a capitalist model of industrial production be transported simply into the art world and be expected to work smoothly? Not that it ever works so smoothly even in industry. No, because it ignores the fact that in the domain of creativity, we must take into account the individual rather than the assembly line nature of creative contributions. We are in the realm of affect here and of the libidinal energy of claiming association with what one has poured bodied effort into. I think here of uh, the welder who takes pride in having found a technical solution to a sculptural problem, of the engineer who winces whenever the ar architect takes Olympian credit for a building that would have remained on the drawing board without the, uh, without the engineer's scientific abilities of the assistant who looks at a painting and tells the viewer, I made that. The various contributors to the artistic process can entertain and advance a claim to the imagining and shaping of the product that is the artwork. And the widening gap between the worker's actual wage and the artist's perceived reward can exact psychological as well as social costs. An extreme manifestation of this predicament uh, was, uh, took place in, eight, in 2015. In what could only be described as a Balzacian situation, a contemporary Indian artist was allegedly murdered by her art fabricator. The artist's death could be seen, among many other things, 
as a parable of vexed class relations, the troubled question of authorship, and the lack of equity. In the karkhanas and the galas in which the installations of many of the artists are fabricated, we encounter an informal industrial economy of production that operates without any of the guarantees that regulate industrial relations. However, I am happy to say that there, there are also metropolitan, academy-trained Anglophone artists who have fully recognized the structure of capital and have deliberately devolved their privilege in favor of their collaborators. A fine example of this would be the collaborative practice of the artist Navjot Altaf. In the late 1990s, Navjot began to work with artists um, uh, Raj Kumar, Shanti Bai, Ghesuram, and others on a collaborative project in Bastar. Uh, at that point, she was already making wooden sculptures which were inflected by her feminist position, a cross between uh, archetypal and contemporary symbolism. She could have easily used the wooden sculptors and metal, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, metal object makers of Buster as her assistants to make her own sculptures. And then once the sculptures would be made, uh, their inter interaction would have ended abruptly, as it often happens in the contemporary art world. And yet, she decided that she did not want to abruptly end this, this, this relationship. She, she wanted to deepen the interaction, and therefore she applied for a grant uh, to initiate a collaborative program in Bastar. And uh, in the late 1990s, she was there, and they, uh, they decided to find ways, strategies of working and being together. And uh, you have, for instance, uh, an artist like Shanti Bhaiya. She worked as an assistant to her husband, the master craftsperson, Retu Ram. And, um, with Navjot's interventions and many uh, discussions that they had uh, together, uh, she, she finally found her own voice and decided not to be a, merely an assistant to her husband, but become an artist in her own right. And today she's an accomplished sculptor and a painter. And, um, and, I, and I think that these are, you know, these, these could be seen as some of the achievements of a collaborative process which is fruitful for both contributors, not just for the artists. And um, as Navjot says, for her, collaboration is a process when there is mutual transformation for both contributors. And um, I, I, I use this term devolution uh, rather than uh, empowerment to explain Navjot's model of working together with the rural artists. And I've written about this in my book, The 13th Place on Navjot. Because uh, I think empowerment uh, connotes a charitable, a charitable act of giving, in which the donor does not give up on any of her own privileges, even as she extends her hand of condescension. But unlike empowerment, which is a paternalistic act, devolution substantially and viscerally implicates the artist in the act of giving. With the desire to engage in a more equitable social relationship, the artist devolves some of her privileges and claims to expertise, and transfers these to the artist who lacks them, after which redistribution, in full awareness of the potential for failed communication, as well as the possibility of a productive mutuality, she collaborates with them in a yet unmapped space of praxis. So devolution you know, does not take the notion of equality as axiomatic. It takes the notion of equality as a work in progress, as something that has to be negotiated constantly. And now I'll just quickly uh, run you through uh, so some of the images of uh, the collaborative projects in Bastar that Navjot, Rajkumar, Shantibai, Gesuram, and many other people in the village, Kondagaon, work together to make. So here you have one of the Pilagudis, a playhouse um, in, in, in Bastar, in Kondagaon, where they, they put uh, mirrors in the roof so that children could actually look at their own reflections while they were playing. And also, it would create a, a certain kind of instability in, in the very act of viewing yourself and also being within that structure. So you have another Pilagodi here, and this is actually based on um, a nine-year-old boy, Somnath, uh, and his drawing. Because they, used to have, they would have workshops where uh, they would um, make designs for uh, uh, potential Pilagodis. And Somnath came up with this design. You can see that on the left, 
where he decided that the, the columns of the Pilaguri would not be load-bearing columns. Instead, there would be an extrusion of the columns. So, so you have uh, the kids, they can, they can just clamber up on, on, on the columns and reach the roof and then use the roof as a kind of tabla, uh, as a percussive instrument which they can play on. And, and, and just above on the left, you have uh, you know, a charging animal, a cow maybe, or a bull. And again, because I think he's very interested in columns, in legs. For, uh, you know, for Somnath, the idea of columns and legs are, are you know, things that you can actually play with, that you can climb up on, or onto. So here is one more example of you know, the possibility of working together. So again, there's a, there's, there's a child's drawing, and then there are all these artists who come together and interpret that drawing. And then what you have on the right is an interpretation of that drawing, which is again a third thing. So this is just a grid of uh, you know, children playing on uh, this pilaguri, on, with, together with. And then I'd just like to uh, end with um, uh, Raj Kumar, uh, uh, you know, who is one of the collaborators uh, who works alongside Navjot. In the dialogue center, I showed you the image earlier where they were building a structure that was actually the dialogue center, which is both a studio space for all the artists, but also uh, they have a space where they hold discussions and colloquia. And uh, this is a space where uh, somebody like Raj Kumar, Shantibai, Ganga, and others can, can, can sit side by side with a municipal officer, a government bureaucrat, a teacher, all these people with whom perhaps if they were walking on the road, uh, they may have very little conversation with them. But once they enter the space of the dialogue center, they, uh, the, the same castes and class prejudices which define the social interaction between Rajkumar Shantibai and, and the other villagers, that, that actually, you know, um, is, is sort of, you know, uh, that, uh, that in a way falls away. And a third space is created, a space which is not uh, a space of, of, a, of a government organization, it's not an NGO-style intervention either, but a space which artists have made together. A space where you can sit at the table, People from across the caste and class spectrum can sit together and talk about art, craft, life itself. And here, in one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, the conversations that they had, um, I was a witness to it because I was invited as uh, as a critic um, uh, to to moderate uh, some of these discussions. And um, I, I asked uh, Raj Kumar. Um, that you know, you've been involved in this. Uh, uh, in fact, I asked all of them. You, you all have been involved in this uh, collabor collaboration project for the last ten years. So, how do you see the act of collaboration today? And then Rajkumar sort of began first by saying that you know, when we had to first use the word collaboration at IFA meetings because IFA had given them the grant for this program, he found it difficult to use the term. And then uh, you know, then 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 we. Uh, then during the colloquia, we were discussing, so then would a Hindi term have actually worked? So he, then he came up with Kalasa Yog, and, uh, and then we were all discussing, but isn't Kalasa Yog more of, of a kind of Sanskritized Hindi, which always reeks of government notifications? You know, the kind of notifications where they, they make you sign a paper by putting your thumbprint and take away your house to build a dam. So uh, Kalasa Yog was also vetoed. And then, you know, I mean, I again asked him, I mean, how do you customize the act of collaboration? And, um, and, and then he said, uh, you know, maybe Bethya. So Bethya is a form of kind of village barter system, you know, where if, you're, if your roof caves in, uh, you, you call your friends and your neighbors, and then you build a, you build a roof uh, again. And then, you know, there's, uh, there's a party, there's a feast where they have chicken and whatever, you know, I mean, they drink and uh, they have a merry, merry uh, get together. So then I said, yes, but th this is still a kind of customary, uh, uh, you know, a social, uh, you know, uh, relationship. And, uh, and then as I was prodding him further, he came up with Akkal Bata Bati, an exchange of intelligence and ideas. And, uh, and, and I was deeply moved when I, when, I, when I heard him say this, because the term Akkal, you know, I mean, it's, it's intelligence is something that, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I mean, an artist like Rajkumar or Shantibai, um, uh, you know, I mean, they, they are never even allowed to perhaps be associated with the term Akkal because they're only seen as skilled hands or people who, you know, repeat a tradition uh, for generations together. So, the, 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 so the, the word akkal, I mean, you know, I mean, which in English as intelligence or ideas, uh, you know, would, would really, uh, you know, in, in casual parlance, it would mean nothing. But in the, the Hindi word akkal, the, which he used, I think that, uh, that had a certain resonance and a charge in that room on that day. 
and, and then bata bati again, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, I mean, exchange. So it's, you know, Hindi halbi uh, mix, akkal bata bati. And, and, um, and also what is really interesting is that uh, he, he, you know, he's, 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 he's talking about sharing. So it's not about being a donee who's receiving something, a charitable act. He's talking about some, a, a, a space that he has created where he as an equal can sit with you and share his ideas and, and that you, a space where you can learn together from each other. So I think that, you know, I mean, th this, this phrase for me was extremely ev evocative. And, and to me, this phrase actually trumps uh, anything that I have read, whether it's in Grant Kester or Mivon Kwan or anybody else. And... Um, I mean, I, I began my uh, presentation with this, uh, you, you know, anonymous fingerprint, if you remember, right? The disappearing fingerprint. But I'm ending this, uh, you know, uh, pre little presentation with uh, the gesticulating hands of Rajkumar. And um, these hands that express the curve of an argument, that dismiss prejudice, that fan out generously, and they're ever eager to, you know, I mean, share their knowledge and their ideas. So... This has been a little journey from anonymity to as assertion of agency. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Annapurna, for those wonderful perspectives and uh, coming from both of your works, the first being the historical uh, background to where craft is today, um, and then some inkling of where craft is today. Um, by um, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to just reflect upon the role of the designer and the changing role of the designer and the artisan in where craft is today. Um, you know, if I take the story from where you left off, Annapurna, and the setting up of the design schools, and um, one of the things that was mandatory in in a design school like um, the National Institute of Design was that product designers and textile designers took on at least once, if not more, to document a craft tradition. And ironically, this was introduced by a Finnish designer who was head of the textile design faculty. And <clears throat> so if you think about the 60s and the early 70s as the time when curriculum was being formulated and um, you had this uh, new generation of designers, um, it was very much in the modernist uh, sensibility. Form follows function. What was the role of design for a modern Indian state um, inherited from the Eameses and other people like that who created for Nehru the first uh, sort of blueprint for a design institution and seen very much from that perspective of post-independence, design being an agent of change, design being uh, an accelerator for industry. Um, and the model was very much designed for industry, whether it was visual communications or any of the other uh, faculty. Um, so you had this designer then go out and work with craftspeople. Um, and I can think of the early interventions with crafts in Gujarat itself, for instance, Bujodi weaving, which had early interventions from the textile design community, um, design faculty. And um, applying that borrowed, westernized, modernist aesthetic to what they were doing. And, um, you know, so a lot of what we saw in the 70s, early 80s, um, as being works of craft um, um, for use, was stripped of decoration, stripped of identity, and stripped of the cultural meaning. I mean, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I do think that was a problem for a whole generation of designers working with craftspeople. And at the same time, you had what Annapurna talked about was, you know, crafts for export, again, crafts for new markets. Uh, the craftsmen, because things were changing, as uh, Vaishnavi pointed out, they, they 
they were no longer making what they were making for a client that they knew. Um, for instance, taking the Bujodi uh, shawl, it was made for a Rabari nomad. Um, they knew exactly which tribe had which pattern and, you know, the identity that was built into the design. But when they were designing for new markets, that link was mediated by designers who were trained in this westernized uh, modernist construct. And I think when I, uh, you know, then um, came back to the craft world in 2010-11 with just beginning to think about the little kernel of what started artisans, um, I heard from a lot of people uh, who were master craftspeople, who were highly successful craftspeople, that, you know, it's great that you're doing this, but you're probably looking at the last five to ten years. It's going to die with me. I don't want my sons and daughters to be doing what I'm doing because, it, it A, I think there was a huge erosion of self-esteem, um, you know, in, in doing things for a designer or for a market that they didn't know. And um, so, so they would rather that their sons and daughters were studying science and engineering and all of the wonderful aspirational things that all of us have kind of been through in our journeys. Um, but I think that that was a real problem, that how do we address this lack of self-esteem? So, you know, I remember some of the early juries at Kalaraksha, which is a wonderful experimental model that I think really works because the idea with Kalaraksha that was started um, in, in uh, Kutch was to, um, instead of mediating what the artisan did for a new market through a designer, was really to bring back design education, not in a, not in a um, patronizing way because they're brilliant at the, the design that they do color and pattern, they don't need to learn that language, but to understand the markets that they're designing for, since the markets um, that were immediately their market or the client and the patrons were no longer wearing what they were making. Um, so I think a very interesting thing happened with Kala Raksha, which is to introduce design skills more in terms of understanding of the market. So the designer would go to the nearest city, often Ahmedabad, and they would be given this um, 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 assignment. How would you design for, say, a Malika Sarabai versus designing for a boutique like Bandage versus designing for Fab India? And so really sensitizing them to the market. Um, and then um, all sorts of um, not just design, but also marketing, branding, entrepreneurial uh, skills that they needed to become owners of their own production, not only design, but production. Um, and I think something very interesting happened, which is that these designers began to look at their traditional vocabulary, but began to look at other influences, just like all of us as design students did. And you had a new vocabulary coming up from these young designers. And you had these designers creating very successful uh, product lines and collections that came to artisans and that were really very brave, bold uh, statements of what they could do and what they could bring. And I think one of the other things, and, and this is all, so I wanted to just go back to um, a sort of uh, anecdote, which is at a jury at Kala Raksha, we were asking the um, artisan, how did you arrive at the price? How did you cost your product? And she said, oh, so many hours of majuri. And I think one of the jury stopped that person and said, is it really majuri? Think about what, you know, the wording that you're using, or is it karigiri? and perhaps even Kalakari. And so this transformation has happened in the last, I think, decade or uh, eight years at least, which is transforming craft from within 
the, the, uh, the very being of the craftsperson from being part of this industrial model that you were talking about, especially what you said, um, where um, it was mass market, you know, soul-destroying repetition and equally soul-destroying this uh, making to someone else's specification. And I think we're looking at new equations between artisans and designers as co-creators, like you were saying. It's not easy because both of them have a very strong vision. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's been wonderful to uh, think back to that initial conversation with this uh, one weaver who, he, who was back at Artisans, and I said, well, what do you think now? And he says, oh, yeah, things are changing. He says, uh, you know, everyone in our generation, the next generation, wanted a white-collar job. They didn't want their collars to get dirty. Um, but now I think there's a new pride in being a craftsman because they're no longer just artisans, but artisan designer entrepreneurs. And that, I think, is um, something to watch out for. Um, and on the other hand, you know, um, just our own journey at Artisans has been one where I, I was very clear that we wanted to look beyond commercial transactions and that commercial relation between the artisan designer and the consumer. And um, if you think about um, it, it was also at a time when the consumption was very much um, a, a beeline to the mall, to Western aspirational luxury brands. Um, and um, the big task ahead of us, and it's still a moving target, is how do we... I don't want to use the word create value, but how do we value um, something that's the product of an artisan's work uh, or a designer working closely with an artisan? And um, I think also it's a question of perceived value, right? I mean, that's how uh, something gets bought because you perceive the value of, say, a crystal glass, not just for it being a glass, but something more than that. Um, and it brings me to something that we saw at the exhibition here, which was our first inaugural exhibition was um, the exhibition of Errol Perez's work. And I thought, you know, at that time, I really wanted to um, explore the fuzzy line between these um, terms that unfortunately have become part of our lexicon of art, design, and craft. And what are those blurry in-between uh, areas where people are creating. I find that very exciting. And when Errol showed his work, he, A, didn't want to sell anything. But then when I persuaded him that, you know, his, he's been making so many of those happy containers, which you saw one of. Um, and it came to uh, our rudimentary first little shop. It was priced as an artist fiber art textile work. And the perception that people had toward, towards this little basket uh, made of thick rope, um, very sturdy and very beautiful, was that it should be utilitarian. It almost looks like a waste paper basket. Why is it priced the way it is? So, you know, this idea of perceived value is something that we always grapple with, with almost each exhibition, because sometimes it's completely new um, to market, first to market or new to market. Um, so that's, I mean, I, I suppose I'm talking about questions as much as answers. Um, and this other um, concept that we, you brought up, which has been very much on our mind, that we decided that we wouldn't show craft in terms of communities but that we would recognize someone who is an important practitioner within their community. I'm looking at uh, Santosh Kumar Dasji as a great example. Um, so, you know, 
recognizing signatures and recognizing uh, voices and recognizing contributions um, and the significance of that individuality. Those are just some of the things that, um, in response to what both of you have said, comes up. Thank you. All right, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you, Anupurna. Uh, You've raised so many points today that I don't know where to start. Uh, thanks to Piramal for having us over here. It's very important that more and more discussions happen on folk art, which remains a very gray matter in, in contemporary discourses, uh, especially when you compare it to what is art and craft, which is one of the points that you raise, or how it fits into contemporary spaces, of galleries, auction houses like ourselves, and uh, also for production. So uh, if I start going through my notes I've been making since it started, it's going to take a long, long time. So I'm just going to tell you a story. That's what I'm going to do. And hopefully this story will raise all the issues that we've discussed. And this is the story of Ganesh Gopal Jogi. I don't know how many of you know him, but uh, uh, consider him one of the best master artists. I'm going to refrain to use the word craftsman because I'm not too sure if that's the right word. Uh, I mean, I think Anupurna and I, when we were, I was at the Aviat Foundation, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about using the right word itself. Is it folk art? Is it tribal art? Is it vernacular art? Traditional art? Uh, outsider art? I mean, that question is going to haunt us for a long, long time till the time we define it. And I think somehow all of us in our own roles are trying to achieve that. So let me tell you who Ganesh Gopal Jogi was. Ganesh Jogi uh, used to, with his wife Teju, go from village to village singing songs, but songs of devotion, songs of uh, religious importance that may accrue to a, a birth in a family or a death in a family. Uh, Radhi would know him very well. She's done a show of the Jogi family. And, uh, but what happens is, slowly and slowly, he realizes that his patrons are shying away from getting them back to sing. What was he getting in return? He was not getting money. They were getting food. They were getting uh, some kind of clothing or some kind of daily objects they could survive on. He was nomadic in a way. So uh, after, I guess, some thought, the family moved to Ahmedabad. They, so from rural to urban, that's a big shift. And they start basically camp at a labor site. That's where they end up, uh, these two artists in a labor site. But there's nothing wrong with that because if you, I've been reading this book by Richard Sennett and he looks at the craftsman, not in terms of art, but anyone who repeats an act of creation again and again. A labor is an artist. A labor is someone who can create and excels at it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But on a chance meeting with Jagdish Chitara, he meets Hakusha. And this is the time when Hakusha, I mean, he's quite underrated actually. Uh, I just realized the importance in the recent times of his role to promote folk art. Like you mentioned Charles Eames at NID, Hakusha in the 60s was there at the same time, uh, uh, looking at artist production, looking at collecting himself, traveling all over, taking photographs for uh, the Sarabhais and Charles Eames for NID's collection. And in the process, he bumps into Eberhard Fischer, who, and Eberhard Fischer shows him something else. Stella uh, asks him to go, go village to village and collecting objects. That show goes to Philadelphia. This is the time, this is modernity in India, as you mentioned. And this is the time when everybody was looking at India and what is Indian. And that's when I think the production of craft took its core importance. The Indian identity came from there. And there's nothing contemporary art of what we call the urban contemporary art today. There was some modern art, which I'm going to not get into. Um, the chance meeting with Hakusha changes Ganesh's life. He's given a pen, he's given a paper, and he said, just sit in my studio and work. And when I happened to visit the studio, I said, how generous was these artists who allowed other people into their homes to come and work? And what does he paint? He paints his life. The reason I'm coming to these points, and I'll try my best to get them together, is, but okay, before I forget what Nancy said about uh, Bastar and Shanti Bai, and there was one artist called Ganga Devi Bhatt who was part of, I think, the same group, which worked with Navjot. She, uh, during the Edge of Desire exhibition in 2007, I mean, she said a very, very important line that as long as I'm going to lie, I'll have a story to tell. And that's what uh, Navjot's relationship with the artist was. They all 
had something to talk about. Ganesh Jogi has the same thing. He only had a story to tell. So his initial paintings was, Aap apna banai, make your own job where you come from. And he was painting uh, stories of him as a shepherd in Rajasthan, moving around singing songs. Teju then started painting mythological tales. And then eventually, somewhere down the line, Ahmedabad comes in the paintings. This is where they were. This is what they were doing. Uh, labor camps. And behind those labor camps were these tall buildings with aeroplanes flying. Their entire visual imagination changed. And the best part was they were spontaneous enough to change with it. And that's the beauty of folk art, that it's always been spontaneous. You mentioned the words loose ended, is this and that. I think that's more in the art structure. But in terms of creativity, that's been the essence of, of folk art. So, uh, so they move to Ahmedabad, they make art, the kids grow up, and now everybody, I think there are 13 or 14 of them. Ganesh is no more, but they're all making art. And uh, they all are carrying on a legacy under signature values. I mean, they all have their own signs which come on it. And it's almost become a little category called the Jogi art. So the reason I was telling you the story is that it involves a lot of the discussions we've had today. And I'm going to try to summarize how, as an auction house, I, I play a role. <coughs> so the first point is, and uh, looking at uh, folk art, is how, as a singer, he had to move. The whole aspect of culture is changing. Um, there's an important line that I wrote here, is that as customs and traditions wanes, people have to make different experiences to keep creating art. This is not only true for folk art, but also for contemporary art. We keep reviving ourselves. And as singing could not be a part of his uh, journey anymore to make a livelihood, it shows that India was changing. And a lot of the folk tradition that we are, maybe we may have witnessed, were already dying, which continues to remain a big threat today. So just keep that in mind. Number two is uh, <coughs> the, the act of meeting Hakusha. Yeah, I think I'll, sorry, my throat's gone. <coughs> the act of meeting Hakusha, and that remains a very important point of collaborations of artists working with folk art. We just heard uh, Nancy speak about Navjot's intervention Hakusha being, being the big impact on Ganesha's life. Uh, this was Jangar had Swami Nathan. So if you look at the, uh, the impact of most of these folk artists today, which have a signature value, come with some kind of intervention, be it, I'm not getting into design right now, but be it modernist artists who were ahead of the times. And I think that's very important. The next point was having an identity, which again has come in contemporary times or I talked about the signature value of every artist. Ganesh started signing while he was alive. His wife learned to sign somehow. Today, Soni Jogi, who actually carries the flame of the family, signs her name much more boldly. And as a woman artist, as you mentioned, the, you know, when you look at Shanti Bai, it was not about, they were equal contributors to the family. They were family earners. So that's an important point to take away from folk art. And the last point in that story is how the artist itself is an entrepreneur. Folk artists now is just not about creating art, but they are going out and they are marketing themselves. So while Sony paints, her husband goes out and meets all the galleries, tries to promote her art, and, and it's all in their own hands. So the reason this, I, was, I was telling the story is because these are the points that we all discuss right now. But there are many, many other things that come up in the art market. One is, uh, if I start to narrow it down, is the act of exhibition making. What derives the value in folk art is very important. It just doesn't come from me hammering down a work of Jangar at five lakh rupees. No, it doesn't work like that. There are many cultural factors. One is exhibition making. And as Anupuna mentioned, it started early on. It was a lot of government patronage at that time. National identity. Bhaskar Kulkarni goes, gives paper to Mithila, and everybody starts painting. Yay, happy sign, you know. But it wasn't just that. In 1989, that major exhibition, you know, Magician de la Tare, was very, very important to put folk art at the same level at, uh, as contemporary art at that time. And I think that is one thing that we've been struggling in our own country, is to distinguish between the art and the craft, or an artisan with a craftsman, or an artist within something else. And I think that, that is something that we need to work on. 
In 1996, Jyotendra Jain tries to do another exhibition called The Other Masters, which is again, he I think picked up five or six uh, of folk artists or who, who had their own language. It was Jivya, Jangar, Ganga Devi, uh, they would, Sonabai, and one more. A Potter. A Potter, yeah. And, but, and this show became a landmark, landmark show today in Indian history when you look at folk art. So that was one intervention. And in 2008, Anupurna curated a vernacular in the contemporary at the Aviat Foundation, which was a long, long project. I think it was almost a year and a half to two years of research, process-based, where uh, we went out to each and every artist, documented them, uh, documented the process, because it was being shown in a museum space where education was very important. But if you look at the trajectory of now, I've just mentioned three shows, it's every 10 years. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important to see that because why are we doing it every 10 years when it's imbibed in our culture? When we have a weekly opening in, in, during the gallery weekend, we have 10 galleries opening together, but why are we having once in 10 years for a folk exhibition? I think that's a very important argument that we all need to maybe look at. Second thing is the role of museums and galleries, artists, gallery relationship, which is very fluid, which is where I think most of the problems arises. In terms of museum, you mentioned the craft museum. It's today's condition is a very, very sorry state. I mean, it's supposed to be our most pioneer space to show folk art, but it's unfortunately, the, it's in a pathetic condition where the galleries have remained shut because of renovation. I remember as a student of art going to Bhuta galleries to sketch all the time. I haven't seen that gallery come back again. And what's more popular is the restaurant, no doubt about it. Always full, even in summers, I'm surprised, even in summers is full, but no one's focused on reviving that museum. In fact, a couple of years ago, the handloom department was supposed to take over and establish themselves. In that old, whole controversy, they whitewashed Ganga Devi's masterpiece. Now, if, you, if I remember reading the papers, one of the unnamed officials of the museum says, now, how do you tackle such a problem where our own museums, our own institutions fail to recognize that the artist is not going to come back and make it? I actually, when I cross-question myself, I think it's a very fair argument. It's folk art. It's supposed to be made again. But then how do we preserve the master artist uh, who may or may not, who may not come back and also the next generation definitely are not producing art or are producing art for a market? Um, talking about galleries, I really can't think of many galleries. I don't want to name galleries, but I think they're less than five who do folk art. Uh, if you look at the Indian art market, just Kulaba would have 10 galleries. So if you look at Delhi, the Lado Surprise has 10 galleries. But we have five galleries in India who do folk art. How seriously? I don't think very seriously. I don't see any changing exhibitions. Whenever I go to their uh, uh, Delhi galleries, whenever I visit them, it's just a market. It's everything's on the wall. Why aren't we putting curatorial kind of expertise or histori art historical evidence of what folk art has been? I mean, there's so much to discuss. The, the last two years I've worked at Saffron Art, the more I read, the more inquisitive I am on tracing the history or development of folk art. I think there's so much more we can do. This show at Piramal is just the first step. I should have mentioned that in the, in the, in the cycle of exhibitions. This is exactly after seven or eight years again. So, but it's, it's, a, it's a good show in terms of it's, it's looking at a very different perspective that none of us look at. It's, it's craft and environment. Both are changing with time. Um, the third thing is very few galleries have come up and wherever they've promoted a folk artist, the artist has become a very important artist. Jivya, and fam Jivya Soma Masa and family showed at the Kimol uh, space, I think 20 years ago. And it became a very, very important show for them to be recognized today. The family, Jivya's still alive. He's no more, as of 2000, 16, he stopped painting, but he's still alive and he still is one of the most important icons we have in folk art. Jangar Singh Sham showed not only at Bharat Bhavan, but was sh shown in a gallery in Delhi, was shown at the Mithila Museum in Japan, went to the Pompidou. That's the kind of, uh, I mean, that's the kind of visual connect they've had with the Western world. I don't know why. And I think that's, an, again, a debate that I would like to come upon at some point in my lifetime. And... Uh, 
But you know, I'll give you one instance. I don't know if you, many of you know, Jangar's one of his first solo exhibitions in 95 in Delhi was quite interesting. So it was a small gallery in Vasant Vihar. I still was in school, so I wouldn't remember the show. But uh, he was asked to remove his clothes because it was a tribal art exhibition. He came in a pant and a shirt. And uh, <laughs> the gallerist asked him to remove that and wear a lungi. And I think I find that really interesting because the way we wanted to portray him was not as an artist who could stand at the same level as the Hussein, who was very popular at that time, or in Delhi would have been Satish Gujral, but as a folk artist. Now, why would we do that? So that's, again, a debate that I'm putting forward. The third, of course, is the role of auction houses. We're very young in this, in fact. Um, if you look at globally, folk art has had a lot of interest and success. Oceanic art, African art, and the Australian Aboriginal art are selling in like half a million dollar mark. African masks are going for 200,000 euros, 300,000 euros. There are art fairs which are dedicated to it. And as Saffron Art, we have just been, I think this is our fourth auction, but only the last two years we have taken up as a, as a very serious way, category of promoting education in folk art. Yes, there are monetary connections, there are transactions, but if you look at our catalogs, it's more about educating the buyer of what the history has been of this fantastic country. So go through it. I mean, if you see that I'm, I'm saying something else, please let me know. Valuations are there. We've managed to sell well. We've managed to, uh, I think, arouse a lot of interest, not only in the seasoned collector, but we've got the new. I have uh, a 23-year-old buy uh, Balu Jivya's work, this auction. And, uh, and I think it's a, it's a good start for us to contribute to this ecosystem that already exists galleries, historians, physicians, oh sorry, I'm sorry, museums, and us. So we're part of a system, we're not away from that. And uh, so pretty much, yeah, these are the points that I want to raise. I haven't talked much about figures, which we can maybe do with a question and answer. But uh, yeah, what else? Wow, there's so much to talk about. What else? Yeah, anything else? Yeah, let's open it up. But yeah, but... In a nutshell, I wanted to just let you know how the art market is functioning, what are the different players, different agencies that contribute, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much. I think that was a very, very interesting uh, uh, series of presentations, and it brought, for me personally, very diverse perspectives. I have actually two, three questions, but I'll just start with one, and then we can. Um, you, you spoke about the sort of no space um, in the regime for the sort of community heritage concept, what I would call community heritage, where authorship is not privileged. The idea of individual uh, creativity, it takes, takes a backseat to the idea of what is tradition and what I want to give credit to. And I was, I was just curious about, in, in this entire conversation around craft and economy, is there, has there been uh, any negotiation space in the rights model, or, or even in India in this conversation, around um, creating a value proposition for this sort of middle space, a very old space, but a middle space that exists? Um, oh, should, I, should I say a little bit about... Ranga? Okay. So, you know, the specific case study that I think you're referring to, uh, which actually seems to play itself out in different ways, places. I, I discussed it with art students at University of Hyderabad who are documenting a family of painters in, who had come to Hyderabad to do painting and they didn't want to sign uh, the wall in a certain way. They wanted to attribute it to their father. So if you look at, let's forget the contemporary artists, but let's just look at, uh, say, the structure of, of, of family life in, in, in India. Today, uh, there is such a complex negotiation between being a pirama and being the son of a pirama, or being, um, you know, uh, some a grandson of J.R.D. Tata and being Ratan Tata. This is a complex negotiation. It's not like you know a linear uh, continuity of community and heritage, right? And uh, on top of that, that kind of structure is not just familiar, but it's also a market 
it, it's also capitalized in a very specific way by the law and by the market. So, for example, this particular family, which I spoke about, they're not traditional uh, bronze casters. So they're, I think they're, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there are three ways to become an artist that's a gazetted artist in Tamil Nadu. One is you come from a hereditary family. The second, you apprentice to a hereditary uh, artist. The third is to go to a college like the Madras School of Art, uh, sorry, the Mahabalipuram School of uh, where Ganapati Stapati was teaching there and stuff like that. So these are the three models Then you, you, you're gazetted. Now, the father went through, was not from a, tra a traditional bronze casting family. He was in a Vishwakarma in that sense. And, but studied under somebody, got this incredible authority. There are many notices and write-ups about his work in Hindu and different local newspapers. The son decided to do a certain kind of experiment with the Nataraja figure. Um, and it's an intellectually a very complex experiment because if you look at the Nataraja image today that we all see as Nataraja, it isolates Shiva, the dancer, as a god. But when you look at this experiment where he's taken all the 108 positions and produced them as bronzes on, and you have all 108, Shiva is no longer a god so much as he's a performer. So he's kind of changed the status through the repetition. And this is a very interesting experiment that he's conducted. But if he's not willing to own it for himself, why? Because there's a certain status attached to being part of a patrilineal uh, thing. Nor, nor does he want to claim himself as belonging to a large community of vismakarmas or stapatis or whatever the word that is circulating. He's claiming that I am the son of so-and-so. My father has made it. Now, what does that do in terms of practical things? Uh, we don't really have a full idea, but if you look at, for example, Hindu property law, right? This won't become his, if, if something happens to him, the authorship. For example, if we lived in a country where secondary sales were actually paid back to the artist, then when it gets sold, then the, 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 the five percent or whatever that the person is supposed to get would not go to him but to his father and then therefore get divided between all of the children after him. So these are very calculated think things. These are not easily negotiated in some sort of casual way. At the same time, it benefits this young man, the artist, to be part of a lineage, right? I mean, because the pressure, just like he talked about, take off your clothes because you're a tribal, be part of a lineage because you're traditional. But let me just step back for one second. I have been working on Madhu, Man, Manu Parikh, Madhvi Parikh, and Manisha Parikh, three very well-known artists uh, in different ways since 2008. Um, generally, when we look at modern art in, in, in a, a kind of social framework for modernism, in, modern, modernism and modern family life among artists, in, in Europe and America, the maximum that's usually acknowledged is the conjugal relationship. So it's Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock, or those kind of things, or Georgia O'Keeffe and um, uh, what's her, huh? her husband, uh, the photographer. Uh, yeah, Stieglitz, right? So we have this. But in India, what seems to be happening, and need, this needs to be thought about very, very deeply, is that we are replicating in the modernist framework the family lineage. Repeatedly, Arpita Singh is the son, daughter of, uh, sorry, Anjum Singh is the daughter of Parmeshwar, Parmeshwar Singh, Paramjit Singh, I'm, I'm like bad at names today, sorry. Paramjit Singh and Arpita Singh, Manisha is the daughter in the, the, of Manudha Parikh and Madhvi Parikh, similarly. So, it is, in a sense, modernism itself is a family inheritance that's passed down. Why is that? One could make that argument. Why is that? Because when people choose to become artists in India of a certain generation, they had to break certain social boundaries to enter that space of becoming a modern artist. Manuda had to leave Ahmedabad. 
He came to uh, Bombay to study. He decided to, he was married at a very young age of 18 or 16 or whatever. And then when his bride came to live with him, his mother wanted to put her in a very constrained space. He didn't like it. He brought her back to Bombay. Now, that didn't win him a lot of brownie points in that structure. So artists are negotiating, and, and I don't think that, that modern artists yet have a way to, we don't have a discourse to talk about this yet. The fact that they still have a vernacular life, you know what I mean? A vernacular life that had to play itself simultaneously as they were being progressives or modernists or radicals or whatever. Whether they chose to make it part of the contemporary in a certain framed way or not, that's a different question. That also needs to be talked about. So this whole question of community Artists marry artists most often. Very few in, in India. If you go to, for example, NID, almost all the NID students marry other NID people. It's true. They marry each other and they breed. <laughs> and their children go to Rishi Valley. So th this is what's happening. Let's be really, really realistic about what's happening. So who's traditional here? So this thing of radical breaking of community is not something that we are like reproducing in some avant-gardist, hard avant-gardist way. There is a kind of alternative familial structures that we're constantly reconstituting, either through the school or through the apprenticeship model or through marriage, or through gallery relationships, whatever it is. It is something that is really there. And that is our modernism. That it's not always just blood kinship that creates the family, but we are somehow finding the family, the idea of the family as a useful model from which to become modern people. And some more questions. Yes, please. Please ask one of our other guests because I think that they will also have lots of stuff to say about whatever I've said or whatever they've said. Okay. Uh, my name is Bala. And most of my experience has been with the multinational companies where marketing is a critical factor. Now, one of the things that we always do, no matter which company it is, is the management of the perceived value. Okay, so for example, if you say take a perfume, a very high-end perfume, you will find it difficult to believe that the lowest price item in that is the thing that which actually goes on your skin. Okay, that's the lowest cost item. Similarly with the high price liquor, the lowest cost is the liquor inside. The iPhone, the cost of manufacture of the iPhone is maybe 10% of what you're paying. The rest of it is all perceived value. Okay, and now when, but when we take a look at uh, art, and especially whether you call it tribal art or folk art, there is no attempt to manage the perceived value of either the tribal art or the folk art. The modern artists, whether they are Hussein or whoever, they've managed to create distinct identities for themselves through their painting. Because when you look at a Hussein painting, most people know straight away this is Hussein. Nobody will mistake a, a Raza for an Ara painting. You know? So they managed to create those almost like a brand identity for themselves. But when you look at folk art and when you look at tribal art, just today I got an invitation for an exhibition at the World Trade Center and it just says tribal art or folk art and that's it. And for years I've been uh, getting this. There's no attempt at making any distinction between one artist and another. So it's all a commodity you now. So when you're talking about commodities, there's no way you can uh, try to get better prices or better anything for that matter. Even in the case of uh, the artists which were mentioned, maybe in these tribal art you can mention one artist. Okay, you'll struggle to get the second one, and the fifth one you would have forgotten, you may need to ask help to uh, get the fifth artist's name even. So this is the extent of work involved in uh, promoting these people. Not everybody can succeed, not everybody succeeds anywhere else either. Maybe there are a hundred tribal artists, five of them will become big, the others will uh, remain where they are. There's the same thing in every industry. But I, I see very little effort in going towards branding. It's a question of how do we represent an artist, particularly an artist who may not have that brand 
image, whether it's uh, representing it on an invitation card, representing it as a story to journalists and people who will, you know, read about that person and talk about them, um, or in the actual presentation at the exhibition. And um, we, we take that very seriously in, in terms of not making up a story, but drawing that story out through our interviews and our interaction, and of course, contextualizing it as well. Um, so it's not just the artist, but it's, um, especially with crafted objects, for want of a better word, um, where the context is really important. What is the related um, meaning that that work signifies for that community, whether it's religious or cultural or uh, what is that meaning? And can we bring that into the gallery in the form of music or related um, um, art forms? So that's almost like looking at the artist. I don't want to use the word persona, but how do we just just helping them to put their their best foot forward? Um, the second thing is, so we work very closely on all of this and start as early as possible. But uh, the second thing is when you talk about perceived value within the artisan's own work, you know, we, we had this wonderful artisan from Kutch, a young 19-year-old, whose work fell into different categories. We had his one-off pieces of work on the wall, and then he'd found that certain uh, images were very successful. And so he made, say, about, two, uh, he, he was a block, he is a block printer. So he'd made a limited edition of those. And then there was the other category that he was going to take to the big Suraj Kund fair. And in terms of pricing, that was the first time when I thought about those one offs versus the limited editions versus the production pieces in his own repertoire being priced differently and being valued differently by who uh, the collector or uh, the consumer who would buy it. So I don't know whether this helps answer in some way. Uh, I want to touch upon the, the two points that you raised. Is one is branding of an artist, second is pricing. So uh, in terms of branding, I think more and more if you see today, artists are being now mentioned in exhibitions. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that you got an invite with just four cards written on it. But uh, as a... As, oh, it's the difference in the venue. Yeah, the venue. Right. The venue. The World Trade Center, it's different from a gallery. Sure. Museums. Sure, uh, depending on who's organizing it. As we mentioned today, ownership has become really, really important for the, the current generation of folk artists. In fact, they, they want to come out of this guild system or a community or a family uh, hierarchy they were part of to have their own names. And which you will, uh, and these are the artists who have reached out into the urban areas, who have seen how artists or other artists are performing in gallery uh, structures. So I, I don't think that's a bit of a problem anymore. But there are, yes, there are many artists who still stay back in villages and who don't want to come out. So secondly, about pricing, that remains a big, a big question for all of us. It's not, it's not transparent. The reason for that is there is again no like a, a, a grid system that we follow in folk, that economy. In, in contemporary art, uh, look, looking at Saffron for the last 16 years, we've been publishing prices on our website. Every auction is transparently, like you can see our figures is there. So there's been some kind of a graph that you can chart out for an artist's career. And of course, there are some, uh, some factors which of course you can't take into account as inspiration in terms of work hours, how much it goes into it, which is somehow the pricing comes in from the studios. Uh, we don't work directly with folk artists, but we do look at rarity of an object. So if you see our auctions, we are not looking at contem most, mostly contemporary 20th century folk art. We're looking at something that we've not talked about this evening, our folk antiquities. I mean, we just talked about post-independent folk art. But if you look at the earlier times, you, very rarely you will find ownership on anything. It was part of a family, uh, a community which performed together they were part of rituals, they were part of ceremonies that maybe the priest worked upon, 
but it was it was an act of devotion it wasn't an act of marketing that eventually if i was wearing a bhuta mask it came into some kind of religious performance and then either buried or discarded uh, uh, at that point of time it's only today when they are coming back as antiques or where they're coming back as valuable objects that you can price them pricing if you look at folk artists today if they come to you they'll give you a different pricing if they come to me they'll give me a different pricing so how do you tackle such problems so these are something this is what i was saying i mean we need to have a larger network we need to have more galleries run professionally to come into the art system and to take it on themselves to promote it our role as an auction house is very very small where it's only in the last two sales you'll see some prices being recorded uh, because we have managed to meet some kind of expectations on rarity like sita devi very difficult to find her work and she's considered one of the most important mithila artists uh, in the 80s she was given this project to decorate the entire akbar hotel which doesn't exist in delhi anymore it's become an office but the entire uh, uh, the mithila the madhubani uh, restaurant had large 8 ft by 4 ft panels uh, on the walls one of which we managed to get for the last auction how do you evaluate that you can't but we know that it's one of the rarest pieces of sita devi that i can get my hands on and looking at the rarity looking at the 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 scale looking at the artist background we actually gave it a very conservative estimate of just 6 to 8 lakhs a masterpiece like that in modern art goes for crores so pricing will take place slowly as long as all the galleries the auction house and the artists come to a platform where we can stop these fluctuations that happen in the market if you go to a heart if you go to delhi heart you can pick up a madhubani painting for 3000 rupees and if you go to a gallery i mean sometimes the same art artist sells for 15000 rupees it's there is no negotiation on that it's going to take some time and i just request you to be patient on that front so i hope that clears a bit more or confuses you a bit more <laughs> yeah Anybody else? Uh, I have a question for them. What do you think uh, makes, the, given the work you've done, the the conditions for for a good collaboration across? It doesn't have to be between a contemporary artist and a person practicing the heredity of the art form. It could be. scientists that what are what are the conditions in your in your research and your thinking about the, what you what you have uh, uh, seen in in the whole buster project uh in the buster project i mean that, that's a that's a great question thank you in in the buster project of course uh, both contributors had to fight against various odds and this is a, this is of course the reason for this uh, being that we live in a class ridden caste society so these were the first hurdles that uh, both navjot and rajkumar and shanti bai had to cross even before they could think of creatively coming together as artists so even something like shanti bai for instance you know uh, you know being able to move from being an assistant to an artist that itself has has to do with the patriarchal system and and and, and how would you you know manage to sort of you know cross that lakshman rekha to become an entity in her own right uh but for example uh, you know i agree i mean what what if there is a collaboration let's say like like shilpa for instance you know she's collaborated with scientists or she's collaborated with noam chomsky you know i mean contemporary artists collaborating with uh, scientists or designers again collaborating dashrath patel collaborating uh, with uh, you know uh, with with artisans with crafts persons to make a very minimalist uh, you know craft for example they could be uh, everyday utilitarian items clothes shoes and so forth in varanasi for instance but uh, i think that uh, in 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 our society when we talk about our own context as i was saying even earlier if you share your class assumptions if you have the same kind of linguistic competence then the collaboration starts in a very different kind of uh, you know i mean uh, situation Th there is already uh, i mean the, the the notion of equality then is predetermined 
And, and then, of course, then you can have... Huh? It doesn't need to be Yes. You know, I mean, so, so that's like a privilege that you already have. And then, of course, you can have creative differences, but then that's the second thing. But, but, but you know, most often, you know, I mean, because we live in a society which has such huge power asymmetries, you are often working with, uh, you know, I mean, large swaths of inequality. And then, I mean, how, how do you actually, uh, you know, try and bridge, bridge that kind of a gap? And I think with, with Navjot also, for instance, you know, when I, uh, when, when I was there at the Dialogue Center, it's, it's not as if they agree on everything. And of course, uh, you know, uh, Navjot also, you know, I mean, could be quite authoritarian at times, you know. So, I mean, we all have our own temperaments. But what I could also see from Shantibai and Rajkumar and others is that they could hold their own ground, you know. And I think that that is very important. And, and let's say the relationship between an artist and a critic as well, you know. The, the point is, can we hold our own ground? And, and I think that these artists manage that beautifully. In fact, she would often tell me, you know, I mean, that there were times when perhaps, you know, I mean, there was a breakdown in communication between her and, let's say, Rajkumar. So, you know, how, you know, she, she was telling me very wisely, there are times when you just let things, you know, I mean, be. You know, there's a time to hold on. I mean, I, I suppose that's from the Bible, right? A time to hold on and a time to let go. So it's, it's you know, colla collaborative relationships are also about holding on, letting go, like, like any other relationship that, you know, that we, that we have in our, in our own families. And, Mm. Uh, those I think uh, contracts are, uh, of course, I mean, very important. For example, uh, let's say, I mean, um, uh, uh, the IFA grant was a, a form of contract, if I may put it so, you know, where uh, they, they were given honorarium, uh, they knew that they were part of a program for a particular period of time and so forth. So I think that that sort of the officializing of this relationship uh, perhaps worked uh, to their benefit because they also had a sense like you know, normally the officializing of a relationship between an, uh, uh, you know, um, let's say an apprentice and a master craftsperson often only happens through this kind of government contracts through the master craftsperson programs. But this was a different kind of officialization of a relationship between a contemporary Indian artist and, and a rural artist. And, and I think that, that that itself was uh, an interesting proposition for both of them to enter into. But I think that be, beyond contracts, contracts are important because, you know, I mean, even for us, I mean, as we know, we, you know, uh, as freelancers, we do a lot of, you know, we end up putting in a lot of free intellectual labor for which we are not paid, you know. So, uh, and, I th and, 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 and there are various aspects of the uh, contemporary art world which are completely un uh, unregulated. You know, you could end up not being paid for a catalog essay for a whole year. And, you know, you're politely, you know, constantly sending reminders, you know. So it doesn't matter what class you belong to, uh, you know, the art world is an extremely un uh, unregulated economy and therefore all of us need to be vigilantes. But I think in the, in the end it's about, uh, you know, holding your ground, uh, you know, uh, finding a way in which, you know, two different kinds of imaginations can intersect each other. And I've, I've always, uh, you know, uh, been uh, sort of, uh, you know, partisan to uh, the intersectional approach, you know, where I always feel that you can be two individuals and you can meet at certain points, at, at certain inter intersections, to agree or to disagree, to part and then to come back again. And I think that that's, that's what you see between Navjot and the other artists in Bastar. Thank you so much. Can I add an example? Um, yeah, so I think collaborations, good collaborations are based on a lot of mutual respect. And I think that's what I saw with the example of Navjot going to Bastar and working a lot with the artists. But my example is of Richard Long and Jivya Sumamase. I think I find that really interesting of two different uh, people, one, one don't, don't, don't even speak the language, to come together and from and going, uh, Richard Long traveling all the way to the Hanu to spend some time with uh, Jivya and at times face in the, in the middle of May in the heat not knowing how to talk or how to communicate or how to live his lifestyle because JV used to go for a nap in the middle of the day or, or he just wasn't in the mood to paint because it was time to go and work in the fields. So, but what I think the best part of that collaboration was that how Richard Long just observed Jivya and, and learned from observation of how he could communicate without having a language to do except for maybe eventually what turned out into art. And, and there are images of him working in the fields or just going for long walks with Jivya without talking. I mean, 
It's, it's mutual admiration of talent that existed, which somehow we may not find today where one party or the other party is attacked, tries to dominate and, and, and maybe curatorially or maybe as a designer. And, and what came out of that, what even maybe Long didn't realize that when he was just walking round and round and creating some of his land art, and when he took down and sat down and took a break, he just saw children come and start playing on that. And how, how he realized his art had a different meaning in India compared to being having a, being, being, you know, squadroned off in the West where people would have to stay behind a yellow line or something. So good collaborations, which are very rare to find, by the way, are based on that mutual respect of understanding your limitations and what you can take away from each other. And I think if that can work, that'll be great. And Navjot is actually one of the biggest examples I think we have. So many questions, there isn't enough time, but um, I'm, I'm trying to sort of still frame it in my head, but what came through in a lot of the conversations was this very interesting relationship that craft has had with the state and the policies around uh, how, it's, how, how value is being negotiated. Um, and I know that some of you touched upon, upon the idea of value and I would sort of take that a little further and talk about cultural capital. Um, and in some sense, the transference of that into economic capital and, and what happens to uh, the idea of that craft in the, in the artisan's head and how that sort of tradition is taken forward. And I, I see that now in 2017, that sort of conversation is coming up again with this big word around cultural and creative industries and, and sort of this entire creative economy. And I'm, I'm just curious about what do you think, um, or rather how do you think craft or folk art or tribal art or whatever language we use to describe this particular framework, um, how is it able to negotiate value for itself in this new idiom of the creative economy? And I'd, I'd really like if, if all of you could answer because I'd, I'd love to hear perspectives of it from the auction space and, and the retail space and also in some sense the academia. So it would really help. Very good question, Rashmi. Um, I think one of the things, when we talk about the creative industries and economic capital, one of the words that we haven't mentioned all evening is livelihoods. Um, gender, who creates, who's involved with the craft communities. And... Um, I think this is a very, very important um, aspect of craft to address as well. That, you know, I was talking about the difference between majuri and karigiri in the person's mind. But that when that very person who is, say, working in Nagaland on her backstrap loom is earning less than a road construction worker who is paid by the Enrega project a certain minimum wage per day, I think, you know, we have to begin to address the questions of how, you know, them making a living. Um, so at a very simple, very individual artisan perspective, I, I just want to put that question that, you know, yes, we've always regarded Indian craft until recently as cheap and cheerful, but, <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to ascribing value, not just to the individual object, but to the um, creative industry that it represents and the economy, um, we need to think about... Um, what we're willing as individuals to pay, but also how um, these endeavors are supported. For instance, I know we were talking about the burden of GST. Um, now, the handloom industry was tax-free uh, until just a few weeks ago. Lots and lots of issues like this that, A, you know, we don't have the patronage or the, um, the equivalent of the National Trust or, 
you know, big government-led funding for the arts in India. Um, and in the absence of that, you also don't have the protection and the support that it requires. Um, it's, it's just at, thrown into the free market economy. Um, so I don't know. I have more questions than answers. What you're saying. Actually, words like creative industry are very strategic. And the government uses words like that very strategically. So if you use the word craftsperson and you use the word handloom and weaver, at least till two weeks ago or whatever, that person would have been exempt from tax. You, you do wage, wave a magic wand and call it creative industry, you can institute a new taxation regime, a new logic of, uh, of, of thinking through issues like um, community knowledge, uh, community ownership of knowledge, all these questions. I'm not saying it's always bad or it's always good. So, for example, when... Um, uh, what is that, that museum, uh, Musée Dôme in Paris became the Quai Branly, uh, they took colonial uh, objects in, that were collected during French, co the colonial exercise. And if you read the literature there associated with it, it's turning all that into um, a kind of museum for creative industries. So the same objects, repositioned, reframed. And this is because France was really looking at positioning itself as something that was engaging creative industries in different parts of the world and had all this stuff. So words like creative industries are not simple words. They're like the way the government has said we can no longer use the word drought. Officially, we can no longer use the word drought, right? Uh, that, has been, that has been said, and it's, you can go online and look at it. So these are, these are really, you know, kind of, Strange little words. So the other thing I wanted to just say is to add is word, you know, creative industry are also tied to words like geographical indication, uh, copyright, um, authorship, um, uh, 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 patenting, all these things. So they're all, there's no kind of clear understanding of how we're going to negotiate all this. So for example, when, uh, when Komalda fought the case on behalf of the people that Nimbuda Nimbuda song, he made a certain decision about how when the money came back from that case would come back to the uh, Mangya community, uh, whether to give it back to that one person who actually wrote the first time, or to, and then to institute a kind of copyright regime in the community, or to do something else to it. And he chose to do something else to it. Yeah, I agree with both Radhi and Annapurna that when you're talking, in the, uh, talking about crafts in the context of the creative industries economy, uh, th the first thing that you have to actually negotiate with is a very bold term that I'm going to use, exploitation. And, we're, and I mean, I know I'm repeating myself, but we're, talking, we're, we're, we're not talking about the Western context, we're talking about the Indian context, where, you know, again, you're dealing with these huge asymmetries. So, I mean, we, we, can, we only have questions, we don't have answers. How, what do you, how, how do you deal with questions of copywriting, patenting, as Annapurna was saying? How do you deal with, uh, you know, severe exploitation of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, skill, imagination, as Radhi was saying, you know, where you're paid less, than, I mean, a weaver is paid less than actually, uh, you know, the, the minimum wage that a Narega worker is actually paid. So I think that, uh, I, mean, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the discussions on the creative industries have been going on for uh, almost like 10, 10 to 15 years now within the Western context. Um, I mean, I, I don't hear you know, much discussion within the Indian context, but I think perhaps, uh, you know, maybe that's, that's starting out right now. But, but I think that we would have to use very different kinds of parameters when we discuss the creative industries here. And uh, again, there has also been... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, a critique of the creative industries economy even within the West. So it's not something that we should be uh, valorizing or, you know, thinking that it's the next trendy thing to sort of, you know, either valorize or, you know, adopt. yeah, adopt for ourselves, yeah. I'm, I'm going to touch upon a different point, actually, but taking from livelihood. So what's, uh, as Anupurna mentioned, 
there was a big boom with some tastemakers in Delhi doing a massive show. Next two years, everybody in Delhi was showing folk and travel. Not even Delhi, I think everyone in India, folk and travel became a big thing. And I think that's, that was a great revival for people who didn't see any livelihood in it, especially the new generation who was running away from it or taking up odd jobs here and there. Uh, what happened after that, of course, is livelihood was there, but there was a lot of reputation in terms of the same iconography being used in again and again. And that's one of, the, actually, I don't know if it's a problem of folk art or not, but that is it. It, it is that. I mean, it was supposed to be repetitive. It was supposed to be mass produced. And, and I could see that decline coming in again in the art market where the artists had no idea what to do. And they, many, many of these crafts actually were shutting shop much faster than we anticipated. But yeah, if you're looking at creative industries, what also has happened out of it, that many of these generations have come back educated. They've been to art schools or they've been to some other schools. They've been engineers who are coming back and taking up their craft again and reviving it. And one of the best examples have been the Kalamkari, uh, which, uh, the, what was it, Kalahasti, which I think nearly shut down and was revived by one family. Then taking from this example, uh, Gofur, uh, Gafur, Gafur, who, uh, the Rogan painting, again, it was completely dead. And then he stuck on through hardships to revive it. So the, the idea of creative industry in folk art is maybe on a different level of discussion. It cannot be linked to these uh, governmental ideas right now. I think it's more about self-driven revival. And I think even the design aspect, Radhi, has changed where earlier on, and I, I was at NID for a bit, where we were going out and documenting craft and did that handmade book, where the designer was going and giving a set of parameters to work on, but never thinking of what the future would be. So while we were documenting, I went from Sambalpur to uh, border of Purulia and somewhere, but I saw the same design being practiced. And what eventually had happened was led to the death of that, that style or that uh, hand, uh, hand-me-down kind of uh, not oral tradition that was passed on for making a bowl completely down, uh, died down and became uh, homogeneous. So, but the point that we're trying to make here is that uh, I'm not talking from the point of view of an auction because we're not linked to that. I'm talking from the point of view of a curator, where you see these actions being taken. And these actions being are taken to a point where we see the revival of craft, folk art, uh, again in the economy. And it's coming to a point where the India Art Fair, for example, has included folk art in their, uh, in their roster of galleries. Last year, Arnapuna curated this fantastic booth showcasing uh, uh, of one major collection and other small collections together. And it, I think, if I remember correctly, the feedback. It wasn't. For profit. It wasn't. It wasn't yeah. Was no sale there. Yeah, it, it was. It was incredible to me that they would actually put money behind this. It was a huge space. It was the biggest booth, by the way, in the, the, in, in the fair. And there was uh, no money, uh, no financial transactions taking place. So how the mindset is changing uh, from, from, okay, from the auction point of view, I think this is the best time to be here. This is the best time because the art fair is including uh, a folk art booth. This is the best time because a lot of these contemporary art galleries in Delhi are now want to, uh, they want to do a folk art exhibition. It's great time to be here because the artist is more knowledgeable and can reach out to you and can communicate to you. Today, Santoshji is here from uh, Bihar. And he can come and speak about his art. He doesn't need a translator to do it. And, and I think in terms, of, uh, in terms of the future, we're in a very, very important junction. And it's where we go from here is always going to be the question mark. Maybe in 10 years, back for a new show. So <laughs> yeah. thank you. I think. Uh, thank you.